Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines we're tracking for you this evening. The Centex and the Nifty snap an eight-day winning streak. Auto and financial stocks drag. Both the indices end a record-breaking week with 1% gains. Paytm gets a thumbs up after assuring investors on its path to profit. SoftBank trims its stake in Policy Bazaar. And more than two crore shares get lapped up in minutes. Is the worst over? for new age companies. A CNBC TV 18 analysis shows the share prices of some companies could be bottoming up. India's G20 share Parmitab Khan says the grouping will work towards a unified policy framework on cryptocurrency. The US Congress begins its first hearing to examine the collapse of crypto exchange FTX, which has sent shockwaves across the nascent industry. The U.S. envoy to India, Elizabeth Jones, says a trade deal between both nations is off the table as their bilateral trade has hit $175 billion, even without an FTA. Zaporozhia mayor claims that Russian missiles struck the city last night. Ukraine president advisor estimates that they've lost close to 13,000 soldiers since the Russian invasion began nine months ago. Meanwhile, U.S. President Biden says he's willing to talk to Putin if the Russian president shows willingness to end the war. The government's online marketplace is hot on the heels of Amazon and Flipkart. The six-year-old website is expected to pip the e-commerce giants on gross merchandise value this year. The CEO of the portal says it is the largest public procurement platform in the world based on the number of transactions. Reliance Infra moves the Supreme Court against the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, claims DMRC is yet to pay the arbitral award of 4,500 crore rupees despite an order from the Apex Court. But maybe a month maximum or maybe 45 days, fingers crossed, the merger should get uh, completed. PBR boss Ajay Bijli, upbeat about completing the Inox merger within the next 45 days, says they're not targeting a large market but a discerning audience with their luxury schemes. And they are on track to add about 100 screens by the end of the fiscal. Twitter suspends rapper Kanye West's account just two months after it was reinstated for posting the swastika. Elon Musk, who had welcomed Kanye to the platform earlier, says, I tried my best. Hundreds of Indian students who returned from war torn Ukraine have gone back to complete their education. We speak with the students currently in Ukraine and explore why they have limited options. Well, straight on to the market action, the Sensex and the Nifty snapped their eight day gaining streak as investors were cautious ahead of the US jobs report for the month of November. The Sensex finally closing 400 points lower, ending above 62,800. The broader Nifty ended more than 100 points lower near the 18,700 levels. The Nifty Bank also snapped a four day winning streak, but despite today's loss, the benchmark indices have ended the week with gains for the second straight week, both up a percent each for the week. So that's the market picture for the week for you. Now, shares of PB Fintech, that's Policy Bazaar, surging in trade after shares totaling 5.1% equity changed hands. More than two crore shares were sold within minutes after they were put up for sale at a 5% discount. Sources say SoftBank is likely to have offloaded its stake after the one-year lock-in period for IPO anchor investors ended on the 11th of November. So it's offloaded part of its stake. It continues to hold about 5% plus. Shares of Paytm soaring in trade today after the company assured analysts that it was on the path to profitability. The management has expressed confidence about Paytm's strong growth and achieving an adjusted EBITDA target by September 2023. Management has also alluded to significant pickup in the credit card segment that's not closing higher by 7%. So how have new economy stocks fared so far and have their valuations hit the bottom? Well, Prashant standing by to decode the stocks and their trajectory going forward. Prashant. Uh, thanks very much for that, Shireen. You know, this is the question we are asking. Have new age companies, platform companies fallen enough? And what we are doing in this is basically looking at each of these companies and uh, comparing them to global peers. The reason for that is very simple because, you know, these business models existed before outside they were launched here in each of the categories and i'll get to that in just a bit but you know let's first take stock of the damage which these companies uh, have actually seen so what i've done is i've taken the uh, sort of market cap at peak peak levels for these companies after all of these companies came to the market and the current market cap this is today's market cap and you can see the damage 
uh, in descending order. Paytm has lost some 75% of its market capitalization despite the, you know, 10-odd percent pullback this week. Uh, Policy Bazaar is next in line. It's lost 70% of its market capitalization. A company like Car Trade, very small, of course, uh, that is uh, next, uh, which has lost quite a bit. Nika, I mean, uh, almost at uh, year uh, all-time low, 60% gone. Market cap fallen from 16 billion to 6 billion. Zomato and delivery, of course, have fallen as well. Uh, you know, this is a statistic which I found uh, shocking. Uh, it's it's a very sobering statistic, really. We talk about absolute fall in prices. But what this tells you is the amount of money that companies raised when, you know, right before in, in their private life cycle, before they came to the market and became listed entities and the current market cap capitalization. Uh, so look at this. Paytm, in aggregate, raised equity money of $4.1 billion and the market cap as of today is $4.2 billion. I mean, its market cap is equal to, after the pullback, is equal to the equity capital that it raised as a private company. I mean, that is uh, stunning. I mean, car trade, of course, much smaller entity. In the case of car trade, its market cap is below what it is actually raised as equity, equity capital. Uh, just to give you a sense, Paytm's decline, first year decline, uh, you know, one year being the stop date, is it, it ranks as uh, some of the, you know, amongst the uh, top four in the world that we've seen, and the others are on your screen as well. So this is basically what's happened in the listed space. But, you know, while we focus on the listed space, some of this has been showing up in the private unlisted space as well. And the numbers are on your screen. This is uh, data thanks to Traxon. Byju's at the peak valuation was $22 billion. It's dropped to about $6 billion. And the others are up on your screen as well. Actually, uh, you know, when you speak with experts, you get a sense that valuation markdowns have still not happened to the degree that they should have happened by now. Maybe founders, early investors are holding the line but they will happen as we get into 2023 and if the interest rate uh, scenario does not really improve. Next, we come to the most important pa part of this. What I've done is I've taken peers, competit not competitors, but peers in each of these businesses, in each of these categories, and compared EV by sales. This is one year forward of uh, EV by sales. I mean, you could have taken EV by EBITDA, but the fact is many of these companies don't make a EBITDA. So this is EV by sales. Take a look at this. Paytm now is at about 2.6 times EV by sales. And the others, like Block, Affirm, Caspi, these are all, by the way, Paytm does a lot of things, so I've taken a ver variety of companies which do payments, which do, you know, fintech, and the larger ecosystem as well. And as you can see, uh, you know, uh, valuations have come in line uh, uh, as compared to some of the other peers. This is Nika. Uh, there is uh, Ulta Beauty, there is Bath & Body Works, and you can see that Nika on EV by sales uh, is still far more expensive than, than some of the others which are trading. Of course, you have to account for the market size, growth rates, business models, etc. So not possible to do all of that here. This is simple one year forward EV by sales. Next is Zomato. Look at uh, DoorDash, Deliveroo, and of course the uh, Chinese company, uh, Mutuan. And uh, you know, as you can see, Zomato has fallen quite a bit. It's come down to about six times EV by sales. Uh, the closest competitor, the closest peer in terms of valuations is Mutuan. Uh, the next is Delivery. And here I've taken a bunch of Chinese companies uh, is sort of, and of course, US-based companies as well, at 2.3x EV by sales. I mean, delivery has come pretty close to where some of the others are actually trading as well. The last is, of course, PV FinTech Policy Bazaar, which again has fallen enough and is very, very close to the, the, biggest, the biggest peer that I could find, which is Goosehead Insurance, US-based, six times almost, and Policy Bazaar nearing six times EV by sales as well. If you go by this, I mean, without making a clear-cut, black-and-white kind of a conclusion, I think, uh, you know, you could start to get a sense that perhaps uh, valuations have fallen and they are now close to being comparable, in some cases not all, close to being comparable to, some, uh, to where some of the global peers are now trading at. Back to you, Shireen. All right, Prashant, appreciate you joining us. And that does give us perspective on where things stand here in India, how much we've actually seen these stocks fall and what uh, uh, they do in terms of stacking up uh, along with their global peers. Appreciate you joining us. Cryptocurrency prices remain lower as investors remain cautious. Bitcoin prices hover around the $17,000 mark, while cryptocurrency Ether remains below the $1,500 mark. Meanwhile, the U.S. Congress has begun its first hearing to examine crypto exchange FTX's collapse. During his testimony, Rostin Bayman, the chairman of the Commodity Futures Trading Commission, has urged lawmakers to act quickly on a crypto regulation. Mylan Mew gets us more from Washington.
Senate held its first congressional hearing on Thursday on the failure of FTX, and one of the country's top financial regulators blamed gaps in federal oversight that allowed companies like FTX to hide potentially big problems in the cracks. CFTC Chairman Rostin Benham said his agency needs statutory authority to regulate the spot market for crypto, and that line of sight could have at least given regulators an early warning of the trouble inside the company. If we don't fill the gap, there will be fraud and there will be customer losses in the future. I am confident, the CFTC, the SEC, I am committing to you that we will work together, we will figure out a path forward. Currently, the CFTC only has the ability to go after fraud and manipulation, and while they can pursue bad actors, Benham said it's better to prevent them from striking in the first place. Now, there is a bipartisan bill from the Senate Ag Committee that would give the CFTC the power it says it needs, but this proposal has also come under fire as being unduly influenced by FTX, which supported the bill. At the hearing, lawmakers defended their work. This doesn't match any of the experience I've had with the legislative process. Um, uh, Sam Bankman-Fried did give a lot of feedback, as did many others uh, from industry, from academia, uh, from the policy community, from your shop and beyond. And everyone's feedback was considered. It's worth pointing out that seven of the 22 members of the committee have received campaign contributions from Bankman-Fried. They all told us that they now intend to give the money away or already have. And staying with cryptocurrencies, uh, the need for a policy framework. India's G20 Sherpa Amitabh Khan said that the G20 is working towards getting a set of unified rules in place to regulate cryptocurrencies. Speaking to me in an exclusive conversation, Khan also said that China, the IMF and the private sector of developed nations need to formulate and implement a debt relief package for struggling economies. Take a look. So as an asset class is something which uh, uh, the government has not yet taken the, the earlier uh, uh, issues were struck down by the Supreme Court and then crypto as an asset class is something where the policy framework is still evolving uh, and what the government of India has really said is that you need a unified policy across across the globe and that policy framework needs to be drafted by a body like IMF uh, I think the IMF is doing work on this uh, and once uh, that would be subjected to discussion uh, during the G20 discussions China, IMF, and the private sector, all three need to sit together and work out a complete comprehensive package for these countries and then provide that this package will be implemented across the board. In Indonesia, China objected to this and said that they will do a one-to-one -one deal on global, that it is their debt and they will deal one-to-one. -one. Now, uh, that will be a challenge. That's the G20 Sherpa for India, Amitabh Kant, on the priorities that the G20 will consider as India takes over the presidency. Now, the government's online marketplace is not too far behind from e-commerce giants like Amazon and Flipkart in terms of gross merchandise value. The six-year-old website has recorded a GMV of more than $14 billion against Amazon's $17 billion and Flipkart's $23 billion. Speaking to my colleague Abhimanyu Sharma earlier this week, the CEO of the portal PK Singh said that GM is the largest public procurement platform in the world based on the number of transactions. Take a look. In terms of value, because we are only into goods and services, the others like uh, the Conips of Korea also deal in works. So they are at number one. We started our journey when we were at, you know, we are just five, six years old. These are all portals which are more than 20 years old. But today, even in terms of value, by the end of this financial, we should be at number two or number three. And in case our scope is expanded, uh, the growth at which we are uh, growing, uh, we can easily be number one in value terms also very soon. Uh, are there plans to expand the ambit beyond the government and cooperatives to the private sector? What are the challenges you are possibly looking at? Uh, is uh, going beyond the government and cooperatives on the agenda? You know, the current mandate is only for government buyers. In uh, last year, we had just included uh, cooperatives. This year only, they have included cooperatives. And uh, yes, I mean, GEM is an evolving portal. I mean, uh, the better we do, the more uh, prospects we'll have. 
Well, that is the CEO of GEM talking about the growth trajectory and what we can expect. Of course, uh, we must keep in mind the fact that there is a mandate that government-to-government -government procurement will be done on the GEM platform. U.S. President Joe Biden has said they will be willing to speak with Russian President Putin if he is genuinely interested in ending the war. The Kremlin has said that America's refusal to recognize Russia's newly annexed territories is hindering the search for a potential compromise. The European Union is reportedly edging towards a $60 price cap on Russian seaborne oil. Reports say there's also a mechanism to keep the cap at 5% below the market price. Sylvia Amaro joins us now with more. Sylvia, take us to what you're picking up. Yesterday, I, I had access to the documents that uh, European ambassadors are discussing. Indeed, the, the document says that they are going to push for a cap at $60 a barrel. The same document says that this cap is going to be reviewed regularly and it aims to have at least a five, to be at least 5% below the average market price for Russian oil. But of course the key here is that even though the 27 European ambassadors have been discussing this for several days, for essentially at least two weeks in a row, the Polish government is still not in favor of this cap at $60 a barrel. And therefore, the Pol Polish officials are still having discussions right now. They're discussing among government officials what they should do because the majority of the EU is ready to go ahead with this cap. Let's see what sort of developments there will be today. There will be a new meeting in Brussels to discuss this later on today. It could be the case that we'll actually see a breakthrough in a couple of hours' time, but that is, this is essentially all dependent on the position from the Polish government. And let's not forget that European sanctions on Russian oil kick in on Monday, and this cap on Russian oil is important because otherwise there will be this outright ban on Russian oil and that could have even wider implications for oil prices. So all eyes on Brussels today. Sylvia, many thanks for joining us. Yes, all eyes will be on Brussels. Now, U.S. envoy to India, the uh, charge d'affaires Elizabeth Jones, who said a trade deal between both nations is off the table, adding that bilateral trade has hit $175 billion, even without one. Moreover, she said that it is India's sovereign right to accept or reject the upcoming EU price cap on Russian oil. Parikshit standing by with more. Parikshit, so that ends the speculation on a possible India-U.S. FTA. Well, towards the end of uh, the Trump regime, we had seen momentum on a mini trade deal between India and the United States. And somewhere after the Biden administration took over, we did not see any kind of momentum for that trade agreement. Now, for the first time, the top U.S. diplomat in India has uh, said on record that there are no talks going on on a potential trade deal and uh, they don't see the need for it right now in the current atmosphere. Significantly, at a time when uh, world leaders are going to come to a consensus on the oil price cap, she said that it is really up to India uh, uh, to accept that it's India's sovereign right on the issue of semiconductors. Uh, they said that there is going to be very intense work between India and United States companies to produce and localize semiconductor manufacturing and reduce uh, the semiconductor supply chain disruptions as well. So clearly are giving a strong direction as far as Indo-US ties go. Parikshit, many thanks for joining us. We will head into a break, but up next, hundreds of students who have returned from war to Ukraine have in fact now gone back to complete the education. A special report when we return. Well, a quick check of the big corporate news that we are tracking this evening. Reliance Infra moves the Supreme Court against the Delhi Metro Rail Corporation, claiming that the DMRC is yet to pay the arbitral award of 4,500 crore rupees despite an order from the Apex Court. Britannia has made a 400 crore cheesy bet. Warren Berry tells CNBC TV18 the company will target a five-fold growth in the cheese portfolio as it gears up to launch more products. Britannia has entered into a joint venture with French cheese maker Bell SA to bolster its portfolio. The total cheese market is estimated at about 5,000 crores. Uh, half of it is consumer and half of it is uh, basically QSRs and institutions. So uh, we already have uh, about 11-12% you know, share in that market. And what we would like to do is we would like to make this business five times what it is in the next five years. 
Well, that's Britannia betting big on the cheese category. Now, RJ Bidgley, the boss of PVR, remains upbeat about completing the merger with Inox within the next 45 days. PVR says they're not targeting a large market, but a discerning audience with their luxury screens, adding that they are on track to add about 100 screens by the end of the fiscal. A lot is, uh, you know, depends on the regulatory uh, environment, uh, or approvals rather, but the main approvals of NSC, BSC, individual NCLT have come, yeah. and I think there is another one uh, happening on the 15th of December, unless a date again gets uh, shifted. So it will take its due course, but maybe a month maximum, or maybe 45 days, fingers crossed, the merger should get uh, completed. Well, that's PBR's Ajay Bichli. Now, it's been over nine months since Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Soon after the war broke out, nearly 18,000 Indian students who were studying in Ukraine were brought back after surviving an arduous journey to reach India. 21-year-old Naveen Shekhar Para from Karnataka died when Kharki was bombed and a few others were injured in separate incidents. However, many students who returned initially have now gone back to Ukraine to complete their education. Radhika Udas reports on the plight of these students and why they have been forced to return. On the 24th of February, Russia invaded Ukraine. The invasion forced thousands of Indian students studying in Ukraine to rush to neighboring countries. The Indian government's Operation Ganga evacuated 20,000 Indian nationals, 18,000 of whom were students. Nine months since, many of these students have returned to Ukraine because they've been unable to secure a transfer to any other university or complete their course remotely. Main thing is the contractor. When you get the good contractor, you will get your document as fast as possible. So we was afraid and uh, we uh, called our contractor every day for to just give us um, our document and let us go from here. After 25 days, we got our document and we just to come back here for the transfer and we took the transfer here. With winter approaching and Europe staring at an energy crisis, Many of these students say they are facing severe power outages. This has made attending classes difficult. Even those students who opted for online classes are struggling. According to me, now, uh, second year, I'm in second year, so there are not many uh, clinical subjects. But in third year, I have clinical subjects, and according to NMC, we have to uh, be present there. We have to do offline studies in our uh, clinical subjects. So second year, I'm, I have decided to stay here at home only. And maybe I hope that till third year, the things get fine and conditions get better. And in third year, I'm, I'm trying, uh, planning to go back to Ukraine itself. The uncertainty prompted many students to come together and file a petition in the Supreme Court in July this year. They sought to be accommodated in Indian medical colleges. The government has opposed this request on two grounds. One, there is no legal obligation to allow such a move. And two, this would hurt the standards of medical education in India. According to government data, out of the 15,783 students who returned from Ukraine, 640 have gone back. A notification by the National Medical Commission says students can continue their education under the Academic Mobility Program by studying in partner universities in different countries. Nearly 170 students have been granted admission under this scheme. The remaining 14,973 have opted for online classes, citing problems with the mobility program. I, I am like ready for mobility, but uh, you provide the, uh, then we will be able to achieve. But because the semester starts in the month of September, so like literally half of semester is already gone. All universities are not issuing transcript of students on time. But relief from the court has still not come. The Apex Court heard the plea for the first time on the 29th of November and has posted the matter to the 8th of December. More than 15 lakh students applied to become doctors in the last academic year. Only 5% of those eventually got an MBBS seat. That's because only 86,000 seats were available in more than 600 colleges across India. The mismatch between demand and supply is stark, and this is the main reason why thousands head to universities abroad for a degree in medicine. In Mumbai, Radha Gaudas. A few options forcing students to return back to Ukraine in search for an education. With that, it is time for us to wrap up this edition of Business 360. Thanks very much for watching. Stay tuned to CNBC TV 18. A lot more coming up.